We are moving on to a collaboration that Hershey did with Michael R. Gottfriedson, Self-Control Theory. So Hershey collaborated with Gottfriedson to propose what they called a general theory of crime, meaning that lack of self-control can explain all kinds of criminal behavior. The main argument of self-control theory is that the origin of crime is low self-control, which results from inadequate, ineffective, and inconsistent socialization, primarily by parents early in childhood. They argued that because all crime or deviant behavior flows from low self-control, people with low self-control are likely to engage in a variety of criminal and non-criminal acts. So offenders are more likely to also be involved in non-criminal acts like accidents or household fires, car crashes, unwanted pregnancies, and so on. Gottfriedson and Hershey pointed to several characteristics of people who engage in criminal behavior that support their argument that the driving factor in criminal and deviant behavior is low self-control. So let's talk about these elements of low self-control. First, criminal acts provide immediate gratification of desires. People with low self-control tend to have a concrete here and now orientation, they argue. Those people are not likely to defer gratification and put off their short-term desires for long-term goals. This characteristic is not restricted to criminal activity, so people with low self-control are also likely to engage in other short-term satisfaction of impulses. They're more likely to smoke or drink or do drugs, gamble, have sex with multiple partners, and so on. That's a reflection of giving in to an immediate gratification of desires. Similarly, criminal acts provide easy or simple gratification of desires. So people with low self-control tend to lack diligence and tenacity and persistence. This is related to the previous point about instant gratification, but this point relates more to the difficulty of a task. So finishing college, getting a job, earning status and stability are not only long-term prospects, but difficult prospects. Finishing school takes persistence and prolonged effort. People who turn to crime then don't have the tenacity to pursue difficult tasks and turn instead to simpler desires. Criminal acts are also exciting and risky and thrilling. Criminal acts involve stealth, danger, speed, agility, deception, or power. People with low self-control, therefore, tend to be adventuresome, active, and physical. They're drawn to high-risk activities. This tendency is not, again, just about criminal adventures, but about being attracted to all kinds of risky and adventurous activities, like driving too fast, or rock climbing, or joyriding. Crimes have few or meager long-term benefits, especially compared to a job or a career. Crimes actually interfere with long-term commitments to jobs, to marriages, family, friends, so people with low self-control tend to have unstable marriages, unstable friendships, unstable job profiles. Gottfriedson and Hershey argued that people with low self-control tend to be little interested in and also unprepared for long-term occupational pursuits. Crimes require generally little skill or planning. Gottfriedson and Hershey argue that the cognitive requirements for most crimes are minimal. You can probably see one criticism of self-control theory with this element because some crimes, such as some white-collar crimes, require a lot of planning and brain power to pull them off. Nevertheless, most crimes do tend to be crimes of opportunity with little skill or planning necessary. Such crimes do not require cognitive or academic skills. So Gottfriedson and Hershey argue that people with low self-control do not value cognitive or academic skills. Likewise, they argue that the manual skills required for crime are also minimal. So would-be criminals with low self-control don't invest in manual training or apprenticeships either. 
Crime often results in pain or discomfort for the victim. Property is lost or destroyed. People get hurt. Trust is broken. People with low self-control tend to be self-centered, indifferent, or insensitive to the suffering and needs of others, Gottfriedson and Hershey argued. They're not antisocial, per se. In fact, people with low self-control might find that being charming and gregarious and generous gets them easy and immediate rewards at the expense of others. But the argument is they're going to be less concerned about the pain or discomfort for other people. Crimes often offer relief from momentary irritation, they argue. The major benefit of crimes is not necessarily pleasure, but the relief of irritation. For example, Gottfriedson and Hershey argued that the irritation caused by a crying child is often the stimulus for physical abuse. They argued that people with low self-control have minimal tolerance for frustration and they tend to respond to conflict through physical means instead of talking it out. Crimes involve the risk of violence and physical injury, of, of pain and suffering to the offender also. So people who are tolerant of physical pain or are indifferent to physical discomfort will be more likely to engage in criminal acts. Not that people with low self-control are necessarily more tolerant of physical pain, but that people who are less sensitive to pain are more likely to engage in activities that bring the risk of pain, like many criminal activities. So what's the cause of low self-control? They're arguing that self-control is really what drives criminal behavior. So where do we learn self-control? What's the cause of self-control? According to Gottfriedson and Hershey, low self-control is not caused by training. It's not like we're trained or socialized into low self-control. They argue that the characteristics of low self-control show themselves precisely when training and socialization is absent, when we don't have adequate training or socialization. Gottfriedson and Hershey argue that the main differences in self-control come from two sources. First, innate variation in children. So they acknowledge that there are some innate predictors for criminal behavior. They argue that these are kind of weak or moderate correlations, but nonetheless, they note that things like low intelligence and greater physical strength could relate to differences in self-control. But the bigger factor, they argue, is the differences in how caregivers recognize and correct low self-control in children. So the primary factor causing low self-control is ineffective child rearing. Gottfriedson and Hershey point out that discipline, supervision, and affection tend to be missing in the homes of delinquents. So their argument is that to teach self-control, primary caregivers must monitor the child's behavior, must recognize that the behavior is deviant, and must punish that behavior. But raising children with self-control can go wrong in four ways, they argued. First, parents may not care for the child. Although we assume all parents love their children and are invested in the welfare or behavior of their children, this is not always the case. Some parents don't have strong affection for their own children. Then second, Parents, even if they care, they may not have the time or energy to monitor their child's behavior. Gottfriedson and Hershey argue that the ability of parents to supervise their children is a major predictor of delinquency. Third, even if they care and they monitor the child, parents may not see anything wrong with the child's behavior. So the child may be acting out and the parents don't think that that's a wrong behavior or a delinquent behavior or they may not think that it reflects low self-control. Fourth, even with all those factors in place, parents may not have the inclination or the means to punish the child. Gottfriedson and Hershey argue that disapproval by people one cares about is the most powerful of sanctions, but not that all caretakers punish effectively. Some parents are too harsh, and some parents are too lenient. Either one can interfere with the ability to create high levels of self-control. 
Although Godfredson and Hershey argued that the family was the primary source for self-control, they did argue that people who are not sufficiently socialized by the family may learn self-control through the operation of other sanctioning systems or institutions, especially school. They argued that school may be more effective at monitoring than family, given the teacher's job to monitor children. Teachers generally recognize deviant or disruptive behavior and perhaps can do so more easily than parents. Teachers also have a clear interest in maintaining order in the classroom, and they have the authority and the means to punish children who act out. If school is unsuccessful at teaching self-control, Gottfriedson and Hershey argue it is because there's too little cooperation between the family and the school. Nevertheless, the net effect of school, they argue, is positive. Overall, school is an effective way to teach children self-control. So that's it for self-control theory, which they argue is really the root cause of crime. So the argument is to develop self-control in children well, so it. that they grow that's up the end and they of don't our discussion offend. about control theories. I hope you learned a lot. I'll see you next time.